everyone and welcome. My name is Andy Porter. I'm Dean of the Graduate School of Education here at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, each year we have uh, a special named lecture after Constant E. Clayton, former superintendent of schools here in the Philadelphia School District, much loved and admired and remembered, and sitting right here in the front row, I call her Connie, I don't know, that's how she was introduced to me. I think everybody, once they met her, they call her Connie. So Connie, thank you for being here, and thank you for all you've done for the great city of Philadelphia. Connie and I thought that uh, this year there couldn't be anybody more appropriate to give this lecture than Bill Height, the new superintendent of schools in Philadelphia. I've had the great fortune of meeting and interacting with Bill on several occasions since he's been here, and I can tell you uh, he's made a tremendous first impression on me. For those of you who have already met him, I'll bet he's had the same wonderful first impression on you. For those of you who are just about to meet him through this talk, uh, you're in uh, for great things. Bill has been a teacher, a principal. He's been an administrator in school districts. He's been a superintendent before coming to Philadelphia, and he's a superintendent again here. He brings the wisdom of the practitioner to this job. And I think that's important. He's practiced his trade, his education, his profession in Georgia, Virginia, Maryland, now Pennsylvania. He has a bachelor's of science and a doctorate from Virginia Tech and a master's degree from Virginia. So when I was thinking about this opportunity to uh, introduce Bill, and I had a chance to introduce him once before, and I, I thought that was just a warm-up cruise. I think I, I'm going to try to get it a little bit. I hope you give me at least a third chance so I can get it right. But uh, some, some words, some adjectives come to me. Uh, Bill's a man of, of great courage. He's a man of wisdom. He's a man of patience. And he's a man of great energy and enthusiasm. Let me give you an example of each one of those attributes. First on courage, he took the position of superintendent in Philadelphia. I can't think of anything more courageous than that. There, there, there are other silly adjectives that come to mind. I'm sticking with courageous. Wisdom. He had the wisdom to reach out and to build partnerships across this great city of ours. He's a builder. He's a collaborator. I think it takes wisdom to do that. It takes a little bit of courage as well. Patience. He's shown the patience to listen to others' points of view on issues at the very heart of what the Philadelphia schools are about. For example, he's listened to people who have different views about the closing of their school and different alternatives. And I read, I think just in this morning's paper, that he thought that he'd learned some things through these many, many conversations that he's had, and that uh, uh, he thinks that uh, his plans can be improved a bit. That takes great patience to listen. I know as a dean, <laughs> sometimes I don't have the patience I should have, but Bill, thank you for your patience to listen to other points of view. He has great energy and enthusiasm. You know, he, he says, I can do it, we can do it together better, but we must 
we must do it. We're going to have to close some schools. There's just no alternative here. That takes energy. And he also is here today. And that takes energy. He's been, I've seen him on this university campus already in his less than half of a year here. Already uh, more than I'm used to seeing superintendents from the Philadelphia School District. Huh? And I deeply appreciate that. Thank you, Bill, for that. Finally, I'm going to use the word love. He has love. He's a family man. He has a wife and two daughters. He has a, uh, he has a, 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 a grandchild uh, as well. Uh, but I think you can see the love that he has for his family coming out and the love that he has for the children, the youth in Philadelphia. I think everybody who's heard him and met him has been inspired by that. And I think love is, is a very important commodity to have oftentimes in too short supply. So thank you for your love for the children of Philadelphia as well, Bill. And thank you uh, for being here with us this evening. His talk today is Leading Through Change. six months. It's uh, been about four months, 12 days, <laughs> um, a couple of hours, but um, I, at some point I'm going to give up counting. Yeah, and, but I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to be here in Philadelphia. I'm thrilled to uh, be speaking uh, at this event. And I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm honored to be the guest lecturer today because of the individual uh, for whom this is named after. And that is Connie, as I so affectionately know her as well. And it's interesting because in a very short time, as a matter of fact, the first time I called her, and I, and I remember calling and I was driving back from a, a weekend here, and uh, it was on a Saturday, and I, I think I caught you off guard, and I just kept saying, is this Dr. Clayton? I said, well, this is Bill Height. I'm sorry, who? <laughs> Bill Hyde, the, the new superintendent, and um, she said, oh, I need to talk to you. And since that time, any time that I call her, she's been available, and not just offering advice, but offering wisdom. And she's become a pretty significant mentor for me uh, and coach. So I thank you publicly for the work that you've done for the School District of Philadelphia. This is a lady who faced a lot of the same things years ago, when she entered this job that, that we're facing today. But she was able to handle it with a lot more style and grace um, than I think I'm handling it with. And I want to also, and I was, as I was looking through some background information, Connie, I, I understand that you were known to have approached the role of superintendent with a messianic zeal. And I think that remains today. And I believe you're the quintessential educator. And I thank you for what everything that you've done for this city, this school district, and for the children, and for the lives of children and the generations that you have saved. And so thank you. Would you please <laughs> They want to 
head off to college or at least to a job. I haven't met one yet who says I want to come to school every day to get in trouble, be suspended, fail. I haven't met one yet. And I think as we think about this work, we have to think about how do we continue to save the lives of children. And naturally, the change part is pretty interesting too because I was thinking reform when we, when I first, and my team and I first started here back in October. And I was thinking about reform. Little did I know that uh, would be the result of school closure, community meetings, that have gone nothing like this, by the way. Uh, it's nice to see all of you. It's nice to see you sitting there and listening. Um, it's nice not to be shouted at and, and screamed at. But nonetheless, what we're finding, however, through that process, is that these are very hard conversations about change. And this is about change. And naturally, there are some reasons why we have to have these very difficult conversations. But one of the things, and I, and I came here, oh, by the way, today from city council, where I was testifying for Evelyn, two and a half, three hours, um, on school closures. And finally, I got to a point, Connie, where individuals were talking about this notion of, you know, you just, maybe if we can get you the money, maybe we can get you the money, we won't have to talk about school closures. And I want to share my response, because I think it's important, and I think it also speaks to how we have to redirect passion to the right things. And the redirection of my passion was, even with the money, we have schools that are not serving children, particularly our poor and minority children. And they've been in schools for years where they are underutilized, and very few of them are reading and or doing math on grade level. So even if things stay the same, we still have to have a conversation about changing those schools. And so as I talk about leadership today, I'm going to talk a little bit about this notion of how do we think about leadership from an organizational culture perspective, and how do we think about innovation. And so I'm going to talk about those two uh, pieces as we work through this presentation. So everything begins, and everything that I talk about begins with what I call a profile of a graduate. And then I actually work that backwards. And so it means that if we start with what we want all students to know and be able to do upon their <coughs> departure from the school district on graduation, then we have to begin to decide on a set of skills around the types of things that are really important. Many of those things are content related, but there are also some things that are not necessarily content related. And I think that um, Tony Wagner did a tremendous job in his book, The Global Achievement Gap, of talking about those skills that all of our children will need in order to be competitive, not just here in this country, but across the world. And so when we think about a profile of a graduate, I'm thinking about not just the content related skills, but those skills and or competencies that help children learn how to problem solve, to think critically, to work as a member of a diverse team, to speak more than one language, to understand diversity in the cultural types of competencies that need to go along with that, to understand what it means to be a good citizen, and, to high, and be of high moral character. Those are many of the things that unfortunately sometimes get lost in the conversation about content and text. And we have to reframe our conversation to really think about the skills and competencies to make students efficient and effective as independent learners. We also want to really think about those organizational behaviors that provide for our abilities to enhance those. And naturally, the notion of developing skills and good work habits. And how do they do that? So as we think about this, this leads to a few areas where we should think differently. And those areas are around some of the challenges that we have. And as I indicated earlier, I'm going to be talking about organizational culture and innovation. And so first, 
want to talk about those challenges and I want to group them into four categories. And those challenges around cultural, types of structures, human structures or considerations, the structure or just the, just the organizational structure in and of itself, and achievement. So a couple of framing questions. A couple of framing questions as we think about this. A couple of these is just as we think about the things that we have to change culturally and think about the young people with whom we're working. And I think about this across the city where we're educating a very diverse group of children. Some come with the prerequisite skills in order to be successful. Others, with others, those skills have to be developed. And so part of this conversation is thinking about cultural changes. Like, how do we make reading and writing relevant in a world that's dominated by high-speed visual cueing? So if you just think about video games and what students are exposed to, where everything is made easier and simple. And so how, as educational structures, do we, do, do, does my team and I think about how do we make reading and writing more relevant to that process? How do we demand perseverance and stamina? And how, as a group of educators, as we're thinking about leading these organizations in our schools, how do we think about this notion of making sure that students have what we call the academic grit to persevere and to maintain and not give up? How do we address historical disenfranchisement? And at these community meetings that we're having across the city for the recommendations that we've made to close schools, and I made those recommendations December 13th. Since then, we have hosted meetings and we've had over 4,000 people attend and participate in those meetings. And what we're hearing a lot of is that this city is a city of neighborhoods. And I've experienced that. And I've been to some schools where students are about to graduate. And now they're going to graduate and take advantage of programs, take advantage of programs that are other places in their district. But they're going to take advantage of them through the community college or through some other training mechanism. And I think that's a disservice to our children because, that, because, because so many individuals are confined and don't work outside of neighborhoods in some cases, unfortunately their choices and their options become very limited. And that creates a historic disenfranchisement. Voter ID is a perfect example of disenfranchisement. Making decisions and not involving individuals who are parents or family members are another example. And how do we begin to reframe that conversation so that we're getting at the historical disenfranchisement? How do we build social capital, particularly among our young people? How do we get them to a point where they understand that there's value in working with other individuals. There's value in sharing ideas. There's value in being a member of a team. And then how do we connect with disconnected youth? And we have a lot of disconnected youth. Some who unfortunately have dropped out of our school district. Others who unfortunately have been pushed out of our school district. And pushed out because of some of the policies and, and procedures that we put in place that doesn't account for their individual needs, but it treats them more like an individual that we're training. And if they don't behave certain ways, then we're unable to address or change our actions. Instead, we put them out. Um, and so now, as we think about the cultural challenges, these are all of the questions that we have to answer. The next are um, a set of questions, and I'm not going to read all of these to you, but the next are a set of questions around the human capital challenges. And this notion, particularly as school districts, how do we attract, retain, develop, and support the best people who stand in front of our students every day? And how do we support, retain, develop the best individuals who lead our schools? And how do we deprivatize teaching? And Dr. Clayton, I don't know about you, but we go through a lot of schools 
where individuals go into their classrooms, close the doors, and in many cases, if there's glass on the door, they tend to put like a poster board or a cover on that. Um, and they go in and they're, they're teaching all day, and it may be good in some cases, it may not be in others. But what happens is that that is a design that doesn't help individuals grow. Because we grow through reflection. We grow through conversations about that work. And so how do we begin to deprivatize teaching? Where, like other fields, individuals are able to give feedback based on things that they see. How do we create the collaborative, how do we create the collaborative development of teaching? Um, in other words, how do we have individuals who talk to each other? And then naturally, how do we intellectualize the craft? And then the structural challenges, we have traditional classrooms now. And I will uh, just pose a question. I wonder if these classrooms are appropriate for what our students need for the 21st century. And we've seen in classrooms where most of the rooms look very much like they did many years ago. Um, but instead of a chalkboard, some have put like dry erase boards. And in some cases, instead of dry erase boards, we put smart boards. But then all of the desks are lined up in the same way with individuals standing in front. And I think about that in a world where information is free, democratized, it's ubiquitous. And I'm wondering then, and I've, I've asked this question many times, what does that value add if all we are are experts of content, when all of that information is already available? And students are not likely to work in an environment that is set up that way. As a matter of fact, many students are telling us, I don't even see how this is relevant for things I want to do. I want to make and engineer video games. Where do we get to do that? Or I want to problem solve a problem taking actual samples from the environment. Where do we get to do that? Um, I want to learn as a member of a team. Where do I get to do that? And so thinking about the typical design of our classrooms becomes really important. This notion of personalized and learning, all of these things become really important. Finally, how do we incorporate new technologies with content and within the content? So it leads to a question, and it leads to a question about achievement, because I talked about that as a challenge. And how do we eliminate gaps in achievement? And we know that achievement becomes a, it becomes a predictor of many other things. Poverty, incarceration, unemployment, crime, health. And it's no wonder that although our country has 5% of the population in the world, we incarcerate 25% of the individuals who are incarcerated in the world. And when you think about who those individuals are, it always comes back to a couple of factors. It's individuals who, in some cases, were disenfranchised, but in most cases, it's individuals who never learned to read, who we never actually saw for in our schools and in our organizations. And so how do we eliminate gaps in achievement and thus save a life? Because this is what this is about. It's about saving the lives of young people, generations of young people. So here it, now we get to the organizational cultural part of this. And before we get to this, one of the things that I want to share, I want to go back a slide, and I always embarrass this young man, um, because when we talk about saving lives of children, I remember when I was in uh, Maryland, and I had to fight because we had some students when we first got there. And we were talking about certain courses, and many of the students who were here understand these courses because at many of your schools, these courses were probably made available. But we had courses, we had some students, and I'll never forget it, we were doing a presentation on two programs. One was on advanced placement, many of you know what advanced placement um, courses are, and then the other was on international baccalaureate. And I remember a young man, and this is not a young man I'm talking about, but a young man who was a member of their school board, he was a student member of their board of education. And the young man said, 
how do I get to one of those classes? And how can you make one of those available at my school? I said, well, you just go sign up. It's available at your school. So the next day he called back and he said, my school doesn't offer those. They don't offer any courses about advanced placement or any of those courses that you call international baccalaureate. And then we did a survey of those, all of the schools as a result of that, and we found that many of our high performing schools, schools with a lot of resources, provided probably up to and over in some cases 30 different options. Then we had other students who were coming from circumstances of poverty whose neighborhood schools provided zero. And if we're talking about access and equity and saving lives, then all students should be exposed to those types of opportunities. So as a result of that, we then committed to make sure that every student had those opportunities. And we created a process where students who were able to take advanced placement had the right to refuse to go into class, but we could not create mechanisms to prevent them from going into the class. And we put at least eight in every single high school, all 26 of them. Um, and as a result of that, we saw, we began to see our minority students, our students in poverty, then begin to do really well on things like advanced placement. But here's what was interesting. They then began thinking about college and opportunities beyond that. Why? Because now they had access and they had opportunities. And so, as a result, there's a young man that um, I came to admire. He was a student, very high-performing student um, in our district. He became a, uh, a student board member. And we had a, we had a countywide election process. He became a student board member. And this young man, what, what strikes me about him is that he was always, and he remains, a tremendous learner. And every time I come over here, somehow, Andy, I run into him. And today he told me that in three months and three days, he graduates from this university. And it's Haywood Perry, who's here. Haywood. And this is why I'm so proud of Haywood and other students like Haywood from uh, uh, Prince George's County and the city of Philadelphia, is because these are young people who all they needed was access. All they needed were, was opportunity. And without that, we don't know what Haywood would have been able to do. Now, hopefully, soon he's going to hear from the White House um, and as he's pursuing a White House fellowship. And I wish you well, Haywood, but I'm really proud of you. But this is about what we have to do because in Philadelphia, we have 200,000 Haywoods. And we actually don't know what they can accomplish because I'm a firm believer that smart, Haywood, you've heard me say this, is not something you are. It's something you become. And you become smart with the right effort, with the right access, with the right opportunities. And so we have to provide for our young people these opportunities for access to these types of programs because we don't know what they can do unless we expose them and then have high expectations for them. And if you meet Haywood, you will understand this young man is a communicator. He's a networker. Uh, he's going to get all of your information and start to connect with you. But I'm just so proud of you, Haywood, because you represent what we're trying to do. And ladies and gentlemen, this work, we talk about leading through change. And people think that the conversations that I'm having about school closures are tough. They're tough. Yeah, because people are annoyed, they're angry, there's a lot of fear associated with that. Here's the tougher part. Here's the tougher thing for me. So when we have schools that are not serving their young people, when we have children in schools who have historically been neglected because no one has taught them to read, write, or to do math, and I want to see the same level of passion around our inability to do that that we see around 
schools that are closing. Because at the end of the day, when we close schools, what I'm saying to everyone is that we have to pivot that conversation to opening schools that offer something more than what the students have right now and offering better opportunities for the students right now. And so I want to see every one of our students, Haywood, have the opportunity to come to the University of Pennsylvania, have the opportunity to, for a White House internship or fellowship, um, and you helped me tell that story. So thank you for your work and thank you for continuing to, to be such a tremendous young man. So organizationally, I said we're going to talk about two things. And first is the organizational cultural framework. And in this framework, it talks about the context. And you can see the context on the far left. And I'm going to actually apply our district and how this looks inside of this framework. And so in the context, and this is actually adapted by, and I can't, it's too small on my paper, so I actually have to read it off of here. It's adapted by Linda Hill and Michael Antony, and this is analyzing group works or work groups. And this is, the context of this, as you can see on this side, it talks about the context in an environment that's economic, political, legal, and cultural. And it really defines a leadership style, and that leadership style, in some cases, may have to change depending on what, what context we're talking about. So if it, it may be a different leadership style for political or legal. Um, and then once that's different still for economics. Now there are a set of design factors in here, and these design factors are around composition, task, and the organization. And then naturally, that leads to a, a culture. And then as you change those behaviors, it changes norms, values, rituals, myths about the organization. And then that leads to effectiveness. And all of this feeds back to the type of leadership style that we're talking about. So I'm going to move quickly through a couple of these. So task, here are some examples. When we think about this in educational entities, the leaders in our schools have to think about the alignment of these things, and we have to think about the alignment from the perspective of activities, the type of work, and interdependencies. And we think about then, how do we create structures that facilitate the type of capacity or the type of environment to allow for teacher leadership? How do we align curriculum assessments and practice? How do we do these things? Those are some of the tasks associated with the framework. Then it goes to the next one, which is the formal organization. And in the formal organization, we talk about the things like structure, systems, and staffing. And as we talk about structure, systems, and staffing, then we have to think about then what does principal flexibility look like? What does it look like to have rigor across all subjects? What does it look like to have a type of scheduling that is in response to what students need. So all of those things. And so as we work through this framework, you can see that we have, we've dealt with the task, we've talked about the formal organization, next is the composition, which is really around the demographics, skills, values, and experiences. And then as we apply that to a school, or well, to leadership in schools, it really becomes how do we deprivatize teaching? How do we develop content knowledge? How do we have a belief system that ensures that all students are held to high expectations? And then how do we really create environments where there is very effective teaching? And then finally, the one, the culture, and the culture are the norms, the shared values, the groups, the rituals, and the myths. And then in this culture, it is, we have to work to get to what we call a college and career going culture. And we have to work on that, not necessarily because of our students, but because of the expectations for our students from adults. And so it really is creating a belief about this notion that all students can at very high levels. And that speaks to high expectations, but it also speaks to um, some cultural and competencies that we need across our organization. Understanding that students who are coming from certain backgrounds will have certain issues that we have to attend to. It's not a problem. We just have to recognize that. 
and changing adult behavior to address student needs. And of all of the things on here, um, that one probably becomes the hardest. Because this is about the Haywood Perrys of the world. It's about our students, their needs, their desires, their hopes and dreams. Many of us as adults, we've already, we've already obtained an education, we have employment, and so this, the notion really needs to become how do we really think about our behavior changes to meet the needs of our students? And what does that look like in, in organization? So context. And as I talked about the framework and talked about context, it really, if we think about context as communities, families and parents, external stakeholders, if you apply that to schools, it really becomes a notion around parent engagement and community engagement. And when I talk about this, this is not necessarily individuals coming in to teach classes. This is about empowering parents with information so that they can help make decisions for their children. They can also help push the district based on the needs of their young people. And to some degree, it's also educating parents, in some cases, on what's available to assist them in actually becoming be better at par parenting and teaching. Um, and so that is inside of the organizational and cultural framework. And I think that's one thing that is really important as we talk about changing cultures. It really becomes how do we create these organizations and inside of this design to really get at a leadership style that provides for effectiveness. Uh, and it is those things, those rituals and routines that we do every day. Uh, they become our actions associated with those things. And our actions associated with messages that we communicate about students that we work with. So we've done all of this. And even in some cases, where we've done all of this, we still have this persistent, pernicious gap in student achievement. And these are gaps that come right down racial lines. And so what about this notion of achievement? And what about gaps in achievement? And that leads me to, so I was going to talk about two things today. Organization is one. Um, and even with the best organizational structure and the best strategies inside of that, we still have this persistent, pernicious gap. And so that leads to this notion about innovation. And I do like the work of Michael Tushman. And Michael Tushman talks about the innovation paradigm. And in the innovation paradigm, he compares generally these organizations that exploit their strengths. And so if we do things well, we're going to do those things better. And many organizations, and many of you have seen those, and many of you have bought products and services from businesses that really exploit to their strength. And when we're talking about um, exploitation and thinking about our ability to innovate, so I want to talk about this notion of exploitation versus the need to innovate. And so part of this is really about when you exploit and then you realign your components. And, but essentially, you do the same thing. You, you generally do the same thing. You just have a better product or a better way of doing it. It's just like starting with small cell phones, then the cell phones got larger, now they're getting smaller again, now they go to tablets. So you, you, you start to do things better. But one of the things that we understand through this process, and Michael Tushman talks about it in his Winning Through Innovation book, is this notion of disruption and where that disruption comes from. And in many cases, the disruption can be internal. That's really hard to do, but in some cases, it can be internal. In most cases, it's external. And it's applied when, and for the business sake, in many cases, when businesses find that they're losing market share and that their strengths that they exploited over the years no longer are sufficient to provide for the types of products that they need. So one of the things that I think 
is important is what Tushman believes to be true innovation. And true innovation, as he describes it, is not just a realignment of the components. So if you think about educational structures, I talked about this, let's apply to schools. We go from a chalkboard with 30 desks to a dry erase board with 30 desks to a smart board with 30 desks. And so, but if you think about disruption, and you think about how we have to prepare students for the world that they're going to live in and be competitive, then we have to think about schools that look very different and organizations that look very different, where the class or the school is no longer in one of these massive structures. But it may be on a work site. It may be at a place where students are experimenting or problem solving. And it's that type of disruption, in my opinion, that we're going to need inside of education. But Tushman talks about this notion that true innovation is disruptive. And he talks about that disruptiveness. And sometimes it's internal, but in most cases, if it's not external, then it becomes, it, it, you go back to the status quo. You come back to this notion of exporting your strength. And so if, in fact, disruption is external or externally applied, and I will say in the city right now, particularly in educational circles, because of something, fiscal challenges, we're going through some pretty disruptive conversations. But at the, at the back end of that, if we don't fundamentally use this as an opportunity to change what our students are exposed to, we'll fall right back into the architecture that got us into this place to begin with. And so this notion of disruption then really becomes very effective when it's also applied externally. And so the, this notion of the innovation paradigm inside of leadership is always this, this tension between when you're going to exploit versus when you're going to explore. And the exploitation comes from us being very good at our strengths. But in order to remain competitive and remain effective, we also have to think about opportunities to explore so that there's innovation. And this speaks to the different types of leadership and leadership styles. And so it helps me with this, and I just always have to throw this slide in, I'm sorry. I mean, I am an educator, I do talk about schools, and so this no notion of theory of action, if I think about, I'm applying this notion of exploitation and exploration or innovation to a classroom. And I'm thinking about this as districts tend to think about how they work and how they structure themselves. And as I think about this, we have a theory of action around teaching and learning. And that theory of action goes something like this that the most important interaction is between a student and a teacher. And that teachers grow their practice when they have opportunities to reflect with other colleagues. And that rigor and high expectations are attained when we align content, practice, and assessments. And that all of these things happen when you have a tremendous leader in front of the building. So why does that matter? That matters because we have a central office structure that doesn't operate that way. We have a central office structure that operates in a way that takes us right back to that exploitation. Because our strength is command and control. It's telling everybody what to do and when to do it. It's treating all 230 schools as if they were identical. And part of what this disruption for me means is that we have to think about this from the perspective of how do we create the environments in our schools that allow for this type of practice, these types of practices. So where do we go from here? And this is a challenge to leaders everywhere. And it's this notion of, uh, Andy, I know you work in Tennessee, and I know one of the things that you guys always talk about, and I was putting a stake in the ground around what you stand for. And I tell our leaders all the time, what is your stake in the ground issue about the children in your building around reading and math and
and safety and environment and respect? What is your stake in the ground? And then we want, we're actually having to help individuals just kind of reconstruct themselves in order to do these things. And so, and the, the, the bottom part, I don't know why. Dr. Clayton, you may know why. In education, sometimes we have a hard time holding people accountable. And I don't, I mean, everybody's so nice. You know, and, I, and I understand, we want to be supportive, but we're talking about the lives of children. And quite frankly, if people can't be more attentive to developing their ability to impact the lives of children, you should go work at Maryland somewhere. <laughs> but don't stay here in Philadelphia, because we don't want you around in children. We want individuals who understand and are responsible and therefore accountable for the outcomes of students. And finally, this notion of innovation. And innovation, particularly at the schools, which means that our principals must have certain flexibilities in order to do this. But these flexibilities just cannot be open-ended. They have to be grounded in student outcomes and accountability. So at the end of the day, we actually don't want you growing flowers out in front of your school. We actually want you to improve on the student outcomes at, um, at your school. And that's how we're going to hold you accountable. And we're going to support you but, and get out of your way so that you can do that work. So part of this, and I talked about this earlier, this notion of how to save a life, and this is the slide where we have audio, and inside of this slide, I think I'm going to click on it. Inside of this slide, this is a set of students, and just think of students who, if in fact we constructed schools and classrooms to meet their needs, what they would look like. They would not look like some of the things that I've described. They would not look like a one-size-fits-all model because some of these students want things that are different. And I just want you to listen to their conversation. I am, I would say, a problem solver, and I would like to go into a field where, like engineering, where you constantly have to have this problem, you have to build something, or you have to change something to a point where it can work, or you fix the problem that you originally had. So I consider myself kind of a problem solver too, but I, I would, I, what I really want to do is help to solve the world problem. Um, I love to learn, and I think science is my best subject. I've been interested in science since the seventh grade, and I just love science to the fullest, and I also like foreign languages because I like how they also create opportunities for you. You are able to do so many things with languages. So I personally favored Spanish since eighth grade and I've been studying it ever since then. And I also took it upon myself to learn Korean, which is also a subject that I'm teaching myself. So I want to be able to use those languages and go out there and help people who speak these languages who don't even probably know English and I can be of great and significant help to these people. I don't think there's enough like guys that are interested in like reading and school work because like here it's like five to one. And I believe that if we get more guys that get interested in reading and writing and math, there will be less people like in jails and stuff. Like this morning, a guy came in and said, there are more guys and there are more black males in prison than any other minority. And I think we can change that by getting them interested in reading and math and all the other stuff at a, like probably elementary school. And the rest of the kids that aren't here to actually do anything because without that, I feel like our English teacher that we have for the past two years, I feel like she has put more work into our English 
and, and uh, reading and the English stuff than any other teacher that I've had. That's my personal belief. Because I feel like from the beginning of the school, from the first day of school, from the first day of the school of the school year to the last day of the school year, she's always there. She's always there to push us to make sure we actually understand and grow and not be in the same place that we were during the school year. She wants us to grow as a group and also as individuals. Well, I don't think if I have never had her have this back this back as a teacher or in the school for ninth grade, you know. I don't think I could have been the writer that I am today because without them, I don't think I would have matured so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like Melissa was saying, if I didn't have Miss Bradford this year and last year and Miss Kua during my third year, I would not be able to do half the things I do today. I would be able to write as well as I can today and to think as critically as I can. I wanted you to hear um, from the young people, and I wish they were here to have this conversation in a in a in a um, roundtable format, so that uh, in a fishbowl. That's what I was trying to think of, and so that you could see them and their passion around their ability to learn as they're exposed to more, and as, they, as many individuals expect more from them. So as I think about this, and I think about this from the perspective of educational leadership, I think about how it applies when we're talking about leading through change. And with our educational system, this is, it really becomes, how do we save the lives of our young people? And we save the lives of our young people by believing in them, by holding them to high expectations, but by never giving up. And so my charge to all of us, um, particularly all of us who are in education or plan to pursue education, and I'm recruiting, um, so my charge to all of us is that we have to go save a life um, if you're coming into education, but if not, then let's leave for change and let's lead for results that will last. I do appreciate your patience and your attention. Now I understand, Andy, we have an opportunity for questions. So thank you. Everybody wants their son or daughter to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an Indian chief, however you want to say it. But what do you do for that kid that does not have that skill to be a doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief? And my question to you is, are you in tune to the vocational education to the point that every child has a talent? And do you identify that talent within that child that even though he or she cannot be a doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief, he or she can be a good electrician, cosmetologist, carpenter? And believe me, when I take my wife to the hairdresser and she charges $70, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about changing my skills. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, do we recognize or do we stop and sit down with the student to say, what is it that you like to do? Great question. And uh, as you're passing the mic back, I want to uh, respond. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. Number one, one of the reasons we say college and career is because we're talking about workforce-ready skills. And those workforce-ready skills are things just like you described. And I think that, um, and this is not just a class. And I was in a, I was in actually, we call it Votech. I was in woodworking. And I, I'll never forget it, when I was in it in middle school and unfortunately, and in high school. <laughs> and I remember one project 
where I made a wooden car out of like this really soft wood. And I had the wheels on it and, and all of those things. And ever since then, I haven't found one job that requires me to make a wooden car. And so one of the things that I think is really important is having access to those, to the development of those skills and then applying them in a work, in an environment where they can use those skills to actually become employable. And I use a couple of examples. So in my last district, um, and Haywood is a graduate of the district, so everyone can feel free to ask him if these things are accurate. But we had a, a student built house project, and our students built 39 houses. And that's what, it, that's what it was called. And students showed up to class at the construction site every day. It's where this classroom took place every day. They, had, they worked alongside of industry professionals. They had the same requirements for permitting, inspections. They knew that they had to measure. They could measure as many times as they want to. They could only cut once. Um, but they did everything from clear the land, to do the masonry, to the carpentry, to the electrical, to the roofing. And then they landscaped it and decorated the house, and then they marketed it. And these were different classes who were doing this. But here's what was interesting. Students who were never interested in college before became interested in college because they felt like now they understood the math. And that's because they were actually applying math every day on the job. We, we had another program like the IT Academy we created. And in the IT Academy, students who attended, the school is called Fairmont Heights, if anyone knows an area around um, uh, the District of Columbia. And Fairmont Heights is a historically African-American community, and like many African-American communities became depressed. Many of the individuals wanted to leave the school. We moved our IT headquarters into that school. Those individuals worked alongside of 80 ninth graders who signed up for the program. These are students who never thought about it before. At the end of their freshman year, all of them not all, I'm sorry, 60 of the 80 met the requirements for A-plus certification. And the others didn't meet it because they hadn't taken the whole series of tests yet. And at the end of their high school experience, there's a full expectation for those individuals to become system engineers. These are students who have never thought about that before. It became so successful they opened a computer repair shop and offered it at no charge, just donations, it became so successful, now they have a standalone shop to computer, for computer repair. So these are students who never thought about that before. Now they're talking about business plans. So my point is simply this, that it is about providing those skills. It's why in our action plan that we're talking about developing and increasing the number of students who have access to career and technical education. Um, it's like the program down in West Philadelphia where students are actually building a car. And, and they're very competitive. And, the car, and they've actually won against, against professionals who actually, oh, no question, they've won against professionals whose job is to build and design cars. The academies, uh, yep, yep. And they, so I think we have to expose more of our students with those opportunities, but we also have to expose them to the opportunities to apply those skills. And I think to your point, it is not just letting the students become trained on that in, in the class, but actually doing it on the job. Because then the students are experiencing what it's like to show up to work on time, to communicate, to get up, after you may have stayed out late. Night. These are skills that have become very important very important for our students. Great question. Dr. Hyde, how do you, uh, you've, you've described a very exciting new kind of school programming and one that I think everyone here would agree would be a highly desirable achievement. But how do you build this kind of a system given the state, state and federally imposed uh, testing regimes that seem to be driving everything in education today? Yeah, that, and that's a great question. Thank you for that question. And, and I was, um, 
I was at a talk the, a couple of weekends ago, and I talked about this notion of testing. And I think we created environments because in order for, so let's just say uh, a perfect example. If we want teachers actually to talk about their practice and to deprivatize their practice, then we have to create a climate that's conducive to that. But if we're only thinking about sanctions with teachers, or sanctions with, I mean, and just identifying what people are doing wrong, um, or just looking at test results and making, um, and making determinations based on those test results, then that's not an environment that's conducive to individuals being more public about their practice. And so part of this, part of my fear, is that we're creating an environment that runs counter to the type of environment we're trying to create. When you look at these young people who are building this car, this automobile, and they're competing, the, those students are learning a lot of things that in a traditional classroom you do not learn. Um, and the tests are not measuring their ability to problem solve the parts um, or the mechanical uh, implications of the car. And so we have to think very, and I do think that assessments are important. I'm not su suggesting that we throw them all out. I think they are important, but within reason. And that I think that I would much rather see embedded assessments in what students do every day so that by virtue of watching a student give feedback back to you or give you information back, then you already know what that strategy should be for that young person. But that should be embedded in what every person does. In Maryland, we stopped talking about AYP. We actually said it was no longer important. And why was it not important? It's because we were then, we were taking the whole system to a level that did not even prepare students for the university system in Maryland. So we were talking about AYP and celebrating it, and the students couldn't get into college. And so we, what we started talking about was really the knowledge and skills and that profile of a graduate, and then we backward mapped that into every grade, which meant that in pre-K, here's what students, here's what we should be doing with respect to phonics or literacy to prepare students to, on that pathway for that profile of a graduate. And that takes time but it also is very problematic in this environment where, because of accountability, and it's, it, we can have accountability, but because of accountability, everyone wants to test everything and then make it public and post it. And then it creates environments where individuals then say, yeah, I'm not going to step out there and try anything because if it becomes public, then I'll be chastised. And that's not an environment that's conducive to students being able to problem solve or to think critically or to do project-based learning. Great question. And that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, thanks for being here with us, Dr. Hyde. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jake Frumkin. I'm a master's student in teaching here and uh, actually hoping to be a teacher here in Philadelphia Beautiful. next year. Um, my question is in line with your, your big question, where do we go? Um, I think that there's two sides to that. Where do we go as a community of intellectuals who I think are much better too often at talking the talk than walking the walk. Um, also, where do we go on a very personal level as someone who would like to be a teacher here in Philadelphia? I mean, you said you're recruiting, but uh, like me and many of my members of my cohort, the District of Philadelphia is not an option for us. So, where do we go? Why, does it not, why is it not an option? Can you say more about that? I'm under the impression that there has been a hiring freeze for a few years now and that that will continue. So. Uh, at least the way that we've been talked okay. to about this, it's, it's not even a possibility. Well, um, please don't give up on us. It's always a possibility. Um, I do understand that um, we are, and I've heard this actually from my colleagues um, from labor, that they're anticipating a lot of individuals who will leave uh, for whatever reason um, uh, over the next couple of years. And so we hopefully We'll still, we still need to hire about 900 teachers a year. And we're beyond the time when we had to lay off large numbers. We've already done that, I hope, and all of those things that we have to do with respect to uh, shrinking our, our teaching force. 
But we still have to hire about 900 individuals. And so where you go, you can start. I know, Evelyn, you're going to kill me. Um, but you can start by just going to the website, clicking on my link, and then sending me an email. And all of you can do that. I mean, not just, not just the young man who stood up. Tell me your name again. Fantastic. Beautiful. <laughs> you have one, I'll take you today. All right, and then the other, the other thing is, uh, the, other part of the, the other part of your question is also a very important one. And this is one about how do we think about our profession as teachers? And how do we create environments where we're actually talking and growing our profession? And now, here's a couple of observations. So I've watched um, young professionals. As a matter of fact, the other night I was with a group of young professionals. And many who were lawyers, some are, some are in med school, some are accountants, somehow they find a way to get together just to talk about their work. They always find a way to continue the network to improve their practice. Um, and if you think about med school, the, the whole thing is public. So you actually walk around with a group of other individuals, you go into the patient, everybody gives, I don't know if everybody gives an opinion, but people give their opinion. And then, so I think that that's a way to improve. And as we think about improving our profession, we can't do that if we're going into to our classrooms, closing doors, and only coming out when it's time to leave to go home. Um, and so it has to become a more public part of how we converse about the work, how we look at student work, and how we talk about expectations, um, and how we provide rigorous uh, support and materials to all of our students. And so thank you for your question and your comment, but I do think it is how we have to think about development. Here's the other thing. Even though you are brand new, you also have ideas that may work well for us. And you, may, you will come into schools, Dr. Clay, they're going to come into schools, and in those schools, individuals are going to say, here's how we do this here. We don't use technology. As a matter of fact, we take it away. We, we, we actually forbid it. Um, and we have to think about then how do we, how do you as new individuals who are new to this field of education actually help think about how we can create that disruption that I was talking about in the presentation. So it's a great question. Thanks. Another question? Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Good evening, Dr. Height. My name is uh, Gershon Singh, and I teach at Strawberry Mansion High School, one of the schools that are uh, scheduled to be closing. You mentioned something earlier about um, innovating our classroom structure, you know, talking about how we have this antiquity this really old structure about how you have your chalkboard in the front and your teacher lectures from the front, and that's how it works. And I am 100% agrees with you that that's not how it's supposed to work. My question for you is how do we get that conversation into the schools uh, so the teachers and administration can have those conversations because quite frankly, we are not. Um, and in fact, we are, um, in my latest, um, uh, observation, I was told that it needs to be that way. You know, you need to have a specific center of attention on the front. How can we have these conversations about change in the schools where the change actually needs to happen? Woo, Lord have mercy, got some work to do. This is my mother used to always say, Lord have mercy. Um, one of the things that, um, I mean, it speaks to the work that we have to do. So we've already begun a process where um, there are several groups, and there are several groups that have been very um, active and providing information up and across. And then, so we're able to actually get information to them, and then they're using their own organic networks to get information out and across. And so it's a couple of your colleagues in some schools that are doing really well. Um, science and leadership. Um, there are teachers over there who have deprivatized their practice. Um, there, um, there are other schools, and I, I always hate to name one, because if I only name one, not to name like a whole bunch of others, because people say, you didn't talk about me. Um, but, but I do have to say, they have figured out how to create an environment that's conducive. Now, they've also extended the network. And so there, you can actually begin to converse with individuals over at Science and Leadership. Here's the other thing. And I, I look for some recommendations from you. How do you get that information to us? 
So how do you get information about your desire to learn more about different structures, different, different configurations for the classroom, using different technologies? Because if I have some technology, then I want to give it to you because you're interested in trying it. And so the other part, and I've asked a lot of groups this. I've asked, I think it was Philly Core, Teachers Lead. The whole challenge is to, is to get information both flowing both ways. So you're not just getting directions, but you're also able to say, hey, have you thought about this idea? <laughs> One other thing, and I, I'm sorry to keep talking about my former district, but I've only been here four months, 12 days. Uh, the, we created what we call an innovation challenge in that last district. And we started it with brand new teachers, just to get them into a place where they were conversing with each other. It became so popular that not only the new teachers want to participate, but all teachers began to want to participate. And we used to give them a problem. And the problem could be around our budget, because we had budget challenges there too or trying to use technology, or communicating with the home. And they came back with some of the most innovative thinking that I've ever seen. And I think that we have a lot, we have a lot of abilities here to do those types of things. We do have a tough fiscal climate to get through um, this next year, um, maybe a next year and a half. And then once we're through that, hopefully, we're then able to begin reinvesting in schools so that we can create the types of technology structures and layouts that you describe. Hi, Dr. Hyde. Um, I'm also a teacher in the school district now at uh, Frankfurt High School. Um, I've been to two very different facilities master plans meetings that you've had. One was before you've announced the school closures and then uh, after you've announced the school closures. Um, and you've galvanized the energy of a lot of school communities. Um, and some of that has come out in a negative way in the, in the sense that some school communities, uh, for example, the schools that are going to be consolidated or you're being recommended to be consolidated in are deeply offended by what has been said about their schools. Um, so I guess what I'm asking is there's a lot of energy around uh, what is going to be happening to these schools um, and how can you get that going into a more positive discussion uh, where all of these communities see that they have the same stake in their child's education, yeah, their I mean, community's I mean, education. Yeah, I mean, you said it, and, and you said it, uh, better than I probably can, and this notion of really then pivoting this conversation away from just this notion of school closures to then how do we create environments that are more conducive for students regardless of where they attend school. But some of, the, some of your colleagues and some of the leaders are beginning to do this already. And I've talked with leaders at schools and some of the areas that are having some pretty tough conversations, to your point, where they're holding weekly uh, open houses at their schools and inviting individuals from the sending schools to come over. And in some cases, beginning to convince people that, hey, I think if we work together, we can, we can actually begin to figure this out. And I do think that, um, and, I, and I, I welcome anyone who wants to sit on stage with me um, in one of those meetings, so that when things come up about certain schools, and it's one reason we invited the principals and many teachers are there, and we've had a few cases where teachers have stood up and said, no, you're misrepresenting their school, and we need more of that. Um, and it's not just the individuals who um, are yelling and screaming because sometimes they're not always parents. And sometimes they don't even live in the city. Uh, and so, so, part of, so part of this is really making sure that we also communicate a message about what we're going to do with all of the schools that remain to ensure that they are safe and provide for the needs of all students. Um, Andy, I know that you are around somewhere. I, I did want to um, take the opportunity because you talked about something earlier, and I thought I saw her walk in, but um, my wife, I thought was here, Deirdre Height. Deirdre, could you stand up? Is she here? Oh, she's hiding in the back. Thank you. Thank you. 
She's going to really critique this later. Yeah. Don't worry. Let her ask a question. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I know you're on a time limit, or are we fine? We got one more question. Up there. Go right here. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Deja Montero. I also work with Mr. Singh at Strawberry Mansion High School. Um, and we have some really strict zero tolerance policies when it comes to things as severe as, you know, fighting physically or verbally to things as less severe as cursing or even wearing a hooded sweatshirt. And any of these could result in in or out of school suspensions for single or multiple days. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to the efficiency of such practices in educating our children. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tough balance, and I don't want to, I'm personally not for zero tolerance, and I'm personally not for that, but it has to be applied in the context, um, in the context of school, and I do know that at Strawberry Mansion, you're dealing with some students who are coming back into the educational environment, um, and in some cases, you have to communicate very forcefully a set of expectations. And so I, I want to recognize that um, because it's not like it's applied to every school. However, I think one thing is, so there's a certain deportment and behavior that we have to expect at schools. Um, I am, this notion of just suspending students um, for stepping across the line or in some cases making a mistake. Um, and here's, here's what students told me, and I've talked with a, a group of students from West Philadelphia. And the students were talking about restorative types of practices. And they talked about restorative types of practices. And here's, and this is their voice, and I'm not going to get this entirely right, but here's what they said. You know, if you only suspend us, and every time you, we do something wrong, you suspend us, and you never talk about us, you never talk to us about other alternatives uh, or other types of ways that we can deal with the same conflict, and when we come back to school and we're faced with the same circumstances, the only thing we know is what we did the first time. And then we're suspended again. And so with restorative practices, at least, at the very least, now I have the opportunity to think about a different way to approach that. And we take for granted that all of our students know and understand that. Um, and I don't think that's accurate. And so I think, you know, we have to help them work through sometimes problem behaviors, and it's really about teaching and how do you interact in, in times when you're confronted with um, a set of negative behaviors. And I do think that the more we're able to help our students confront those types of things, the better we will be at creating different cultures in our schools. So I'm not for the zero tolerance, although I do appreciate what you and your colleagues are trying to do at Strawberry Mansion, and I commend you for it. Uh, I think now is a good time to uh, sw switch to another venue. We have a reception just outside, and I think uh, Bill will stay with us for a little bit. And uh, I thank you all for coming. Please join me in thanking you.